Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Thought Leaders, where we'll bring in uh, experts from their respective fields. And today's we got a sales expert, uh, Jamie Shanks, who's the CEO of Get Leverage. Thank you for joining us today, Jamie. Chris, thanks for the invite. Of course, man. Um, tell us a little bit about Get Leverage and, and who you guys are working with. Easiest way to think about it is within your sales and marketing teams, there's a lot of $5 an hour tasks being done by your onshore team. That's a complete waste of time. And it's detracting from the $500 an hour value creation that sales leaders, you as a founder, if you're doing founder-led sales or sales professionals could be doing. So we buy back those tests. So we're a full service agency that does all the behind the scenes sales and marketing support tasks to free, to kind of bifurcate and free your team uh, to work on bigger initiatives. Got it. And, and what kind of companies are you guys working with right now? Everywhere from solopreneurs, micro entrepreneurs, or micro SMB, to the mid market, all the way to the global enterprise. It's that it's a pervasive problem in sales and marketing that there's way too much administrivia and administrative tasks being done by high valued uh, talent that is not a best use of capital and time. Got it. Fair enough. Um, cool. We'd we'll love to kind of get into more around that side of the business. Uh, but before we do that, I know you've um, you've had a few businesses, but you started off your career originally, it seems like in, in, in financial sales or investment sales. And how was, how did you go into that world into them being more involved into, you know, the tech side of things? Um, cause it's, it's a little bit different in terms of, I think like, you know, I, I think the sales mindset could be very, very similar, but the product is very different. So I'm sure there was a learning curve involved there. Yeah, my father's best friend and roommate at university was the CEO of a division within uh, kind of investment representative arm of the Bank of Montreal. So okay. when I was in grade nine, I didn't want to be what my parents are. My father's a geologist working on oil rigs and my mother's a neonatal nurse. Didn't want either of those jobs. I wanted to be a stockbroker. And okay. so even from grade nine, all through university, I worked at Bank of Montreal I wanted to be a stockbroker until I became a stockbroker. And then I realized during the 2000 crash, that is the last job I wanted. Moved to Australia, did my master's degree. And when I came back, I landed into commercial real estate and then eventually SaaS software. Yeah. But yeah. in the sales side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think sales is sales is sales a lot of the times. Uh, and there's also, I think, uh, across industries, there, there's different skill sets that, um, can be leveraged for for one for one another. What having worked in different verticals, you know, and especially I would think like now with with tech and software, it's um we're going back to some of maybe like those old school tactics of like account based marketing, building relationships. Uh, you know that is that is almost like kind of like how financial advisors and financial service representatives have gone through and built their book of business, right? And so. Um, talk to us about through those some of those cycles of like what you've seen work in the past and you know uh and, and maybe some of the things that don't work anymore that you're seeing or, or some some things that we're cycling back to right now. I think you just hit the nail on the head. So when you start as a financial advisor or you start in commercial real estate, both are in professional services and yeah. professional services firms for the most part is designed as what's known as a portfolio model. And that portfolio model means that your job is to acquire a net new customer, win that customer, and then service that very customer. Now, the only reason that those two roles were bifurcated was because as Aaron Ross's predictable revenue came out, say 15 years ago, they started looking at the labor arbitrage that was between the act of acquiring a lead and then the winning of a deal. And what Salesforce did a great job of was, was to separate those two acts. And at that time, the inexpensive SDR and BDR, the labor arbitrage was three to one, five to one times cheaper than the account executive. And so what started to happen was you would separate the talent. Those that would open a door would be paid X and those that would take it from discovery or sales qualified lead to win were paid Y. But one of the advantages of working in professional services is you don't have that luxury. And so I, from day one as a teenager, and then even in their, you know, my early 20s, I learned full cycle sales mm. from lead identification to account selection and account prioritization to account planning to account engagement to 
you know, winning a deal to negotiating to discovery, discovery calls and negotiation proposals, the whole bit, win the deal. And then even servicing the customer for upsell, cross sell uh, uh, account retention. So you learn it all. And I think that that is one of the challenges that's hurting sellers that have not been exposed to that. They have a myopic view of a part of a sales process. They don't actually understand the entire sales process and how account selection highly dictates account winning and then highly dictates all those other details. You can predict account retention based on all the conversations that happen in account selection, account prioritization, account engagement. They're all interconnected. And that's an unfortunate piece that's been missing. But obviously, right now, there is a massive shift back to a portfolio territory model. Yeah. I mean, he speaks. So, I mean, I know, I know why that is. I mean, we saw like this huge bump of like the SaaS vertical go, go crazy for 10 years from, you know, like 2012, 2013, up until like just, to, wow. just maybe a little bit over a year ago. Right. And yeah. so you didn't need to be a great salesperson to win deals during that time. Right. And so um, I think a lot of people got, well, a lot of the junior salespeople that came in during that, that boom rush probably were winning under a, a, a disguise of, of, um, of ego where it wasn't necessarily like based on a skill set and it was just based on the market. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of, a lot of salespeople are now struggling that and wondering why, uh, and then having to go back to this portfolio based, you know, selling. And, um, can you talk to us a little bit about how we lost that way? I mean, obviously I think, companies are trying to grow as quickly as possible. You know, they try to be as efficient as possible, but in, in that they're probably losing a lot of the fundamentals and they've done that for a good part of like the five to 10 year period. Um, can you, can you shed any light around what you've seen there? And was there any predictability around this uh, in terms of that, you know, obviously this can't last forever and that the way that things were being done was probably not the best way. Yeah, so there's a bit of a macro. I'll give the macro and the micro. Yeah. So here's the macro. Let's uh, let's be in the mind of a CEO, myself, yeah. chief financial officer, private equity firm, the whole bit. 15 years ago, there was a massive disparity between what you paid a 24-year-old and what you paid a 44-year-old. Easiest yeah. way to think about it. And so that was the concept that struck a chord within Salesforce. And that that labor arbitrage could be ex exposed and, and created as operating leverage to be able to ensure that we hire people at a lower salary to be able to execute this task. And that task was from account selection all the way until creation of a sales qualified lead. And we're going to pay X. And that meant that our cost of customer acquisition could be competitive even, and remember, a lot of software companies were not profitable. So now all of a sudden, our cost of customer acquisition to lifetime value would be in a great ratio. Our payback period will be in a normalized ratio. And we could scale because as long as we could predictably open doors, then we go to the piggy bank that is venture capital, private equity firms, factoring our finances, whatever we need to do, factoring our, our ARR, we'll pour that money back into our sales motion and we'll grow fast, hyperscale, blitz scaling, as you know, Reed Hoffman would call it. So that worked. But over the years, what ended up happening is the salary of the BDR and SDR started at $35,000 and $40,000 USD and started to creep up to 50, to 60. To, now we want, now our on target earnings are in the 70s and we want stock options and we want, but here's the other part. It's called the desk fee. The desk fee is all the other operational operational expenses that go alongside the seller. When I started in sales, I was given a telephone and I was pre-salesforce.com, but let's use yeah. CRM. Then LinkedIn, it was free. Navigator didn't even exist then. So my tech stack, pretty basic, but my operating expense, my desk fee as a seller was pretty low. And over time, the average sales team started having 20, 30, and I've seen studies where there's upwards of something like 41 tools 
that are, or it could even be higher than that. Between the sales department, revenue operations, uh, marketing, all have that are part of the sales and marketing contribution. So the big problem is the overall cost burden of that seller. Not only did their salaries accelerate far beyond inflation, going from 35,000 to 70 some thousand, but it's all the auxiliary things between stock options and, and insurances and vacation pay, and then the myriad of sales tools. So your burden costs start to look a lot like an account executive. That account executive then in COVID times gets asked to go, those six figure people get asked to move inside and become digital sellers or inside sellers. Now there's this like total confusion between, hold on a second, got my SDRs working from home, got my AEs working from home. Their salaries aren't even that far apart anymore. Like what is going on here? So that's the macro problem. Any CFO finally woke up in 2022 when times got tough and went, oh my God, my cost of customer acquisition has swelled where my payback period is measured in years. Mm. Our customers aren't even lasting years. So all of a sudden, like we're acquiring customers at a loss. Like this doesn't even make any sense. So we have to trim our sales and marketing expenses. Now on the micro level, on that micro level, as I described, is that what happens to sellers is we assign sellers the task of sales. Okay, let's just use an account executive. Your job, the outcome, is to create me sales and revenue, units and dollars. Great. But the sales leaders say, well, here are all the things you need to do, your roles and responsibilities of being a seller. Well, so many of those roles and responsibilities, and in fact, measured by Gartner, about 10 hours of every 40-hour work week or 50-hour work week is spent on administrivia. Yes, you're in sales and you're given up a territory that's geographic, it's verticalized or a set of named accounts, but then you're asked to, I want you to tell me all the companies in that territory. I want you to enrich the database with all the contacts. I want you to learn how to use sales loft and build a cadence. I want you to hit the drinking bird button a hundred times a day by sending out mass emails. I want you to do all these actions and activities that classically we were all told we had to do in sales. But when you really back up and you analyze it from the lens of return on investment, there's really only a few things that you do in sales that are super high value. You run really great discovery calls. You ask great questions that unlock the customer's mindset and you discover if they're a great fit. You build a buying committee consensus you negotiate proposals that are fair win-wins for you and the customer and you win deals. That's $500 an hour. But all the rest of the tasks that you've asked your six-figure sellers to do are a complete giant waste of time and a, and a burn on capital. And so slowly, companies are starting to recognize that, wow, what we had been pouring into sales and marketing as David Ogilvy, the owner of, uh, you know, he's an old ad agency guy, he used to say that 50% of your marketing budget is a complete waste. You just don't know which 50% it is. The same sort of thing applies to the total sales and marketing contribution. There is so much wastage that finally companies are using zero-based budgeting to start to recognize, wow, we could still use this predictable revenue model, but we can start thinking about all the tasks that people do of completely different expenses and we'll have different people do those things based on return on investment. So that's how I'm seeing the world completely transformed based on the financial issues that are going on in today's world. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you throw in a few other variables I think of is like high turnover of those entry level positions of the SDR, BDRs. So that's even has to be calculated in terms of like- Calculated much- the cost of recruitment yeah. onboarding and then offboarding creates a hole in a territory that's akin to six to 12 months of lack of sales. So when you have people churning and burning out of, an, uh, out of a company because they get into sales, oh my God, this is impossibly hard. I hate it. They leave. It costs you way more to acquire onboard and now offboard and create that hole then you got out of production out of that seller. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think also, yeah, that that's definitely one of those issues. And uh, part of the, I think the, the cost of acquisition, 
Uh, I think obviously the cost of capital has gotten a lot more expensive. And, and so these companies don't have a open piggy bank to go after anymore. And it's not uh, as easily accessible or it's really expensive capital. Um, so yeah, they're definitely hunkering down on what they're spending it on. Um, you know, and obviously I think this alludes to what you've built with get leverage, right? Which is <clears throat> taking care of a lot of those administrative tasks that is a lot of that, um, that fat that exists in the marketing budgets, uh, so that the sales teams can focus on what they're primarily good at, as opposed to doing the administrative. Um, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts, uh, between how AI plays a role in that and then how much of the, of, of you know, human capital plays it, right? I think there's some things that AI can be good at. There's also, I don't think it's like as robust as it's been put out to be, or at least like if those have who tinkered around with it quite a bit, there's been a lot of like over-promising and under-delivering, especially in the sales and MarTech space, I feel like. Um, but we'd love to kind of get your thoughts around it, right? Like I know that, um, I don't think it's going to replace like sales reps, but <clears throat> I do know like sales reps are using it for getting, for doing a lot more research and doing a lot more personalization um, and, 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 and leveraging it in that sense. Uh, but love to get your thoughts. So I have a very polarizing viewpoint as to the power of AI at this current moment in time. And where you as a chief revenue officer, chief marketing officer should be spending your calories around this. And here's my take on it. My take on it is very simple that I, as the guy who pioneered social selling, got to watch the advent of CRM and marketing automation come in to my sales ecosystem even before I became a sales consultant. And I got to see the long tail effect of usage and utility and adoption against the amount of time that sellers spin their wheels trying mm -hmm. to figure these tools out. Then in 2012, I pioneered social selling and I got to watch that same dance happen, not only between LinkedIn and LinkedIn Sales Navigator, but every other social platform, Google+, Meerkat, Periscope. I can name dozens of these type of social media platforms in the 2010s that became pervasive or were the next thing, the clubhouses of the world. Yeah. What ended up happening is every sales organization in the world and every sales enablement department in the world wanted to master and have their sellers master all these tools. Now, there were some that were great usage of time. LinkedIn and LinkedIn Sales Navigator is an incredible tool. It is like a Porsche for a racetrack. As long as you have your driver's license, you know how to drive manual or standard, and you're interested in actually learning how to be a race car driver. That's a Pareto's law of sellers that want to do that. The other 80% of sellers, they drive the bus. They don't have their license. There's all myriad of reasons why they don't use the race car. But all these enablement teams put so much energy into getting everybody. You've got to learn how to use Google Plus, and you've got to have a landing page of your own self on MySpace. And, you've got... and only now looking back as a 45-year-old gone through a couple of waves do I recognize not only are we in the first inning of AI, but there is a better usage and utility of time spent in this current moment for sellers. As a side hustle, it would be very interesting for sellers to learn prompt engineering. So you understand what is prompt engineering? What does it mean for me? What's in it for me? What are its use cases later down in the future? But again, you can employ people to learn these skills and do these things, a combination, and it's all about operating leverage. You have other people learn all these AI tools and together between human judgment and AI, they do the things for you, whatever those outcomes you want. You want your CRM cleansed, you want better analytics around your sales forecasting, you want market research or signal intelligence uh, to figure out uh, buying intent for customers. There are, that again is a $5 an hour task. And so asking your 100, 200, $300,000 a year sellers to back up and spend their precious time trying to go through courses and certifications on prompt engineering to get little output from it. I'm old enough and wise enough to say at this moment in time, that's not where you should be spending your calories. You should be mastering the art 
of better relationships with the customer, working on better ways to do frameworks of discovery and qualification to maybe shorten sales cycle velocity, get your AEs prospecting again, get them in the game opening doors because they have greater reach and reputation. These are all things that are a better use of time. AI is going to be part of sales. But at this current moment in time, it feels very similar to the 19 social media tools I saw come and go. Because right now, everything's like a point solution. Let other people give you the answers and the outcomes to the tests while you go work on the big stuff. Yeah, I love that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think about with all I think about those those 19 different tools. I mean, there's there's more than that. Obviously, I think it, that's like helping, you know, claiming making big claims for how it's helping to enable sales and marketing and, and all that. But I always think about like attention and attention being a commodity and specifically like marketing attention from a prospect. And I don't think, you know, enough, enough like sellers think about this or contextualize it where you're not only competing with your direct competitors for that prospect's attention, but you're probably like competing with like 10 other categories and all the players within those categories for that attention. I'm so sure. yeah. yeah. Right. And so at the end of the day, you are, I don't care how, you know, how clever or how personalized some of these things in are that the tools are helping you to do. But again, you're also mentioning Pareto's principle, which is like, you know, 80% are already doing it wrong because they don't have the basic requirements of like having a license or having the the knowledge base or the skill set to actually be doing, running the correct queries um, to do it right. And so what ends up happening, I feel like is like the prospect is just being over inundated with with like marketing collateral that's coming to them that it becomes almost psychological where they become very dismissive to anything that's coming through those channels. And I think like the way, I mean, I would, I mean, LinkedIn, I agree has been, has been a great channel, but then you start seeing a lot of these things. That's like, I get hit up all the time. I'm sure you get hit up all the time by people who are doing it just in a very poor way. And what does that do to you? It helps you. It ultimately doesn't help you, but it, it also it ends up like I think creating like this layer of friction where it becomes very difficult for you to discern what's valuable and what's not valuable in there without spending a ton of time in it. Right. And that becomes a problem for those that might be selling the cure for cancer because it's not about the product anymore and it's not about the value, but it's about how noisy a channels become. Do you think, how do you think about that? Like, cause I think that's another pro problematic issue that AI is creating that we don't really talk about is just like, it's not helping to get to the output. It's. I agree. And so this will, this is kind of what founders teach each other. Um, and this, I'm going to put it in the analogy for sales. I'm a big believer that as a seller, you're actually an intrapreneur. You are actually a business within a business. And if you were to back up for a moment and look at yourself, not as having a job in sales or a career in sales, but a vocation, meaning this is what I am committing my whole life to. I'm going to be in sales. Great. That's your vocation. That's been my vocation. Now, if you gave me only 30 minutes a day to commit into learning something new, trying to master using ChatGPT O or Zero or whatever they call it now, to write me the greatest email, or I decided to spend that same time to start planting a tree for myself of becoming a lighthouse, not a tugboat. And what I mean by that is I'm actually going to every day commit to starting to build my reach and reputation in my total addressable market. Every day, I'm going to, as an example, I might write a part to a newsletter, or I'm going to make a video or I'm going to write a story of success or failure from a customer experience. That could be on LinkedIn, that could be on other mediums. Now it's not going to feel like it has an immediate return on investment, but over time, people are people like people like themselves, meaning there's a saying, people like people, people like people like themselves, whatever that saying is, customers are attracted to those that they feel you've walked a mile in their shoes. It's, I will buy from the internet doctor before I'll buy from the random doctor. Why? Because the internet doctor has this reach and reputation and it's like a sense of authority. 
And a seller sometimes don't understand that, that like whatever you're selling, say you're in insurance, you could be sharing uh, insurance pitfalls, it, uh, fail of the week. Here's a customer that forgot to insure general liability of their building. Never thought about it. Guy slipped and fell, cracked his head, and now they're being sued. Like just every day sharing a story. And a percentage of your market slowly will be like, oh man, there's the insurance guys. I'll give you a, a, an example of this. I'm a boater. I own a cottage. I love boating Instagram things. There's an Instagram account called the Qualified Captain. And the Qualified Captain every day has videos taken from around the world of boat fails, boats coming into the marina hot, smashing into other boats, people sitting in the bow, falling over, all these fails. And then every couple of days, he'll do an instructional video on how you're supposed to tie up a boat, park a boat, why you should never put your kids in the bow, all these sort of things. Long and the short, this is a perfect example. It's just constantly sharing stories from the road. And people will, and then of course he sells something, which could be, you know, ropes or life jackets or whistles or whatever it is. The same sort of thing applies to you. And that adage will never go away. If you invest in you to be the lighthouse, that's going to have far greater return long-term than will be like, I'm going to master, do I use the word if or then in my sentence? Like, you don't know. I would invest in being the, the lighthouse more. Awesome. Um, I think on that note, we can end it because I think that was a great last piece of advice uh, around where people should be spending their time, especially if they're making that decision to enter to the sales world. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to say thank you so much for taking the time um, out of your day. That was that was great. Very insightful. Very well spoken about it. Um, very well thought out in terms of think, I think it just really shared and showcased your area of expertise for these past few decades. I'm old. I've been doing it a long time. It's awesome.